Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Bethel. Please stand. Let's worship together. Our first song this morning is, uh, is an old favorite. I think pretty much everyone knows and loves this one. We'll do this as an echo. So Joy and I will start on this side and the parking lot side can follow along with Naomi. Oh, 
That song is an old camp favorite, too. <laughs> we had some uh, dancers, some campers that are heading off today that are very excited, and we're getting started already, so I love it. <laughs> Good morning and welcome to Bethel. Um, we'll be welcoming back uh, Pastor Kenny to preach for us. He'll be getting here in just a little bit, and he'll be sharing our message today, so we're excited for that. Want to remind you that we have a Bible study on Wednesday nights downstairs in the Fellowship Hall, so be sure to come out and join us at 7 p.m. on Wednesdays. As always, we're praying for and continually collecting uh, food donations for our food pantry. We are always in need of the staples like canned meat and soup and beans and things like that. If you're out and about shopping and you can pick up a couple, you can bring them in and we'll add them to our, our uh, supply over there. But you can always donate to our food pantry. Just mark those donations for the food pantry and pray for the amazing work that God does through our pantry, for the community, and through our volunteers. It is camp time. Um, we've got fifth and sixth grade and high school camp this week, so a bunch of us are heading up this weekend, or for this week, to spend time at camp. So keep those campers in your prayers, safe travels, and for an amazing time spent up at Camp Layal with God. Vacation Bible School is just a few short weeks away. Um, there is an online uh, sign-up sheet. There's also printed ones in the Narthex, so be sure to sign your kids up so we can plan for how many we're going to have. Bring uh, all the kids in the neighborhood that you know. It's a great time, just a couple hours. We give them a snack so they're not starving for those two hours around dinner time, and it's just a great time to be together. So there's still lots of things uh, volunteers can do if you haven't signed up yet. Talk to Joy or Mandy, and there's, there's a space for everyone, and so um, we transform our church and it'll be a great time to, and we're excited to bring VBS back um, this year. So we've been uh, away from it for a little while. So uh, next Sunday, uh, be here 1030 for our donut Sunday. We'll uh, have donuts and coffee down in the fellowship hall and we'll celebrate our July birthdays as we wrap up the month. And then a um, reminder to uh, fill out your registration books that are there in the pews if you have not. And it, we are closing out the, uh, this month, which is our one great hour of sharing collections. So if you weren't here or able to donate last week and you want to give to that, there's still some envelopes in the pew. And you can support that um, mission or that uh, offering that goes to uh, support missions and all sorts of work throughout the whole world. And with that, would you stand for our scripture reading this morning? Today's scripture comes from the book of Titus, chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. This is God's word. God, oh, your name is so beautiful. Lord, today we come to your church, to your house, to worship and praise you, to feel closer to you, to learn about you, and God, just to spend some time in your presence. We thank you for all that you do for us, for our loved ones. 
and that no matter what, you are always with us. We pray today that our service would please you, that you would anoint it, and that we would feel your presence in this room. In your name we pray, amen. Please be seated. As we move into our time of offering, we invite our ushers to come forward and remind you that you can support the ministry of Bethel Baptist here in the sanctuary as the plates go by or at home through our website or mailing in a check.
please stand as our ushers come forward. Linda Gardner will pray for our offering this morning. Dear Jesus, thank you for the bounty of gifts that you continue to give on each one of us. Please accept this offering in your name to further your name. And help and please stay with the five campers and Joy who are going up to camp today. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Now it is time for our congregational prayer. <laughs> How can we pray for you today? My, my niece has been on my heart lately. Um, she struggles with mental health and addiction, and um, so I just wanted to ask her to be lifted up. Just continued prayers for my uncle Rick and his wife Linda, who are both battling cancer and going through treatments. So, her uncle Rick. Don Hutchison is home. He had the triple bypass and double lung transplant. Doctor said he would be in the hospital for two months. He was in for less than 10 days after, and he's off the oxygen now at home. Wow. Prayers for our country. This upcoming election is a mess, and we need to pray for our country. Uh, keep Hannah in your prayers. She wakes up with a headache almost every day, but she didn't come to church this morning because her head was hurting so bad. So just keep her in her prayers that she would find some relief for her headaches. Um, I just want to give thanks to the Lord because while I was at Green Lake, he healed my breathing. So... Kenny, would you pray for us? <laughs> yes, I can. Does that mean I can take this off my ear? Okay. All right. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your sovereignty. God, we lift up those who are struggling with cancer for those who are battling addiction. And God, I thank you for being in control. God, I pray that your hands would be with the doctors and the nurses and the treatments and the family who are loving and caring alongside those individuals. God, we thank you for praises, for healing, for surgeries and procedures that have gone well, for healing from breathing issues. God, we pray for health with headaches. Um, Lord, we lift up this country. Father, I pray that this country would be more committed to you than to any political party. Father, I pray that we would know that you are in control and help us to love people the way you love us. Father, I thank you for using broken people like us for your glory. I thank you for the opportunity to gather together and to be able to worship and praise you. God, I pray for camp this week as fifth and sixth grade and senior hires will be up there and I pray that you would move in hearts and lives, that decisions would be made for you, that hearts would be recommitted for you. God, I thank you for this church family. I pray that you would meet each and every individual where they are, whatever valley or mountaintop that they are on, that you would remind them that you are there walking every step with them, carrying them when they need it. God, I thank you that the blood of Jesus is enough. We pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Good morning. You, you, well, I'm good on the mic? All right, all right. Well, how's everybody doing? Can you believe it's almost August? I know, I know, you're welcome. My wife's a teacher, she's mad every time I say that. Uh, not really excited that that's coming, but 
you know, we've been preaching through the book of Titus at our church, and so you just get to continue in the book of Titus. Um, so if you've got your Bibles, I want you to open up to Titus chapter 3. And, and just kind of a little background in Titus, the books of Timothy and Titus were books that were very important to me as a young man going into ministry. Now, I say young man, like I, some of you would be like, you're still young. I'm not as young as I was, okay? I mean, I got hired as a youth pastor when I was 20, so I've been in vocational ministry for 23 years. Yes, for those of you that aren't very good at math, that means I'm 43. Um, but going through there, these are, these are, this is a letter that Paul wrote to Titus, and, and the Timothys were written to Timothy. And in fact, there are three individuals in Scripture that Paul refers to as his son. He calls Timothy, he calls Titus, and he calls Onesimus his sons. And that's interesting because within the church, there are probably people that maybe look at you as kind of a mom or maybe look at you as kind of a dad, or we become family. Yeah, I don't know how many times I've had that conversation, but it, here at this church, you are a family. And I'm a part of that family, even though I might be like a stepchild. No, but I, like you come in here and you're a part of that family. And I think those relationships are important for us to look at and to see. The love that Paul had. And so Titus, Paul was writing to Titus, and Titus was left on Crete, and he was kind of establishing and starting the church. And so now, I don't know all of your stories intimately, but you don't need to be leading a church. You don't need to be a pastor. Pray for your pastor. Pray for pastors that you know. We need it. We're just as broken and sinful as you. Okay, but know those things. But Paul is giving instruction, and really it's kind of instruction on, on how to lead and how to live. And those are instructions that we can all use. Because let's be honest, if we're here, we're all living, right? And you might not consider yourself a leader, but you are. Whether that's a leader in this church, whether that's a leader in your home, whether that's a leader in your workplace, Maybe you're just a leader in your circle of friends, and you might go, but I don't know that I would consider myself a leader. If you have a relationship with Jesus, he has called you to lead in some way, shape, or form. And so these are things that we need to work on, and Paul found it important to share these words with his son, Titus. And so we're going to take a look at those words, and how do we live, and how do we go from there? So if you've got your Bibles, open up to Titus chapter 3, and buckle up, we're just reading the entire third chapter, because who doesn't just love diving into the Word of God? Starting at verse 1, it says, remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always to be gentle towards everyone. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of righteous things that we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. Verse 9, but avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. Warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. You may be sure that such people are warped and sinful they are self-condemned. As soon as I send Artemis and Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me in Nicopolis because I have decided to winter there. Do everything you can to help Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way and see that they have everything they need. 
Our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order to provide for urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. Everyone with me sends you greetings. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Now, I love at the end of Paul's letters, like he always kind of gives shout outs, right? He's like, hey, tell this person hi. Make sure to give a hug to this person. Right? It's like when you see someone that you haven't seen in a while and you see some of the family and you're like, hey, tell, tell your kids hi. Tell your, tell your neighbors hi. Give your mom a hug for me. Because Paul truly valued and cared for people. Remember, he left Titus on Crete because they were establishing a church. Have you guys ever established a church? Can I just tell you something that we don't say very often? Church people are crazy. <laughs> right? And that's all of us. That's me too. But we, we can be needy. We are just as broken and sinful as anybody else. We're just washed by the blood of the Lamb. We've just been redeemed and we know Jesus is our Savior. That doesn't make us perfect. Now, Lord willing, we repent and we turn from that sin as soon as we see it. But let's be honest, I don't frequently like to be told that I'm a sinner. So he gives this task to Titus, and he tells them, these are some things that you need to do. Now let's just step back for a moment, and there are times that I think it's just good to ask questions. Anybody like to ask questions? In fact, if you read through the Gospels, oh, Dennis, don't point to your wife. Uh, listen, <laughs> but like when, when Jesus was asked questions, there were often times that he would answer a question with a question. I'll be honest, I don't care whether it's Paul or whether it's Phil or whether it's Kenny up here, you should ask questions and everything that you hear, you should run through the Holy Spirit and God's word. Don't ever take what I or anyone else is saying and just be like, hey, Kenny said it, it's true. That will get you in trouble. Run it through the word of God, run it through the Holy Spirit. But as we go through here, there are some things, and so I just wanna start with the question. Question one for you, and there's not a ton of questions, just a couple to start. Are you a reminder? Now, what does that mean? So here at the very beginning of Titus chapter 3, Paul tells Titus, remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities. Are you a reminder? One of the mantras in ministry, and I'm pretty sure I've shared this here before when I filled in, you may be the only Jesus that anybody sees on any given day. Now, there are times that I look like Jesus, and there are times that I do not. And I'm sure that goes for all of us. But are you a reminder? When people see you, how are you leading? Because I think that's really important that Paul is sharing with Titus because he's going, listen, as a young man leading in the body of Christ, this can be at work. This can be at your house. It's here. When people see you, do they see Jesus in the way that you talk? Do they see Jesus in the way that you listen? Do they see Jesus in the way that you care and carry yourself? We are to be a reminder. Now, we're gonna hop back to Titus chapter one, and I wanna look at verses 10, 11, and 16, because in Titus one, we kinda get these descriptions from Paul. Verses 10 and 11, Paul says this of chapter one. For there are many rebellious people full of meaningless talk and deception, especially those of the circumcision group. They must be silenced because they are disrupting whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach, and that for the sake of dishonest gain. And now jumping down to verse 16 as he closes out that paragraph, he says, they claim to know God, but by their actions they deny him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. Are you a reminder? Or is that you? By your actions, are you reminding people of Jesus? Or by your actions, are you denying him? Now remember, all of us did not. Peter denied Jesus multiple times. I deny Jesus on a regular basis based upon my heart or how I respond or how I do things. But yet I'm called to be a reminder of who Jesus is and what he's done. I want people to know the hope and the joy that I have. I want people to know the hope and the joy that you have. 
to be able to see someone go, he's home from the hospital early and he's healing and, and God is moving. Those are things that we need to share. Those are things that we need to shout from the rooftop to say, man, I went to Green Lake and I came back and my breathing is just better. Those are things that we need. Guys, I, I read this passage and it was just awesome and it changed me. Those are things we need to share. Now flip with me to chapter 2 of Titus. You might not even need to flip a page. It's all on the same page in my Bible in front of me. But verses 11 through 14, so this is kind of the, the opposite, flipping the script from those that are denying him. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. So you've got this group of people, this group of people that was stirring the pot. How many of you guys like to stir the pot from time to time? Oh, yeah, I know there's a few of you in here. That happens. Sometimes it's fun. I used to like to do that in college, right? If you could just get the professor off topic and kind of get this sidebar conversation for an hour and then class was over, right? Yeah, yeah. How many of you guys have tried that in Sunday school? Uh, okay, all right, all right. At least you're willing to admit it. Okay. But yet we look at what Paul is telling Titus here and he's saying, listen, salvation has been offered to all people. Now, A, there's beauty in that. There is beauty in that because you know who's a part of all? Everybody. You, me, and that person that you can't stand. All of us, salvation is there and offered. And yet we come through here and he reminds us of who Jesus is and all that he's done and that he's given himself to redeem us from wickedness and to purify us to be his people. Do you know that when you know Jesus, you are Jesus' people? You are a part of his family? And yet he also says that those people are supposed to be eager to do what is good. Now let's just real talk for a minute. How many of you guys like to be bad sometimes? Okay. There are times. <laughs> Whoa! I'm pretty sure that was not Cal being bad. Uh, okay, all right. But, like, there are those moments, right? There are those moments where we, we aren't eager to do what is good. Sometimes it's not fun to do what is good. Sometimes it's work to do what is good. I mean, he's called us to serve. He's called us to care for the needs of others. There are times that I'd rather sit down and watch the game than go care for someone. But I hope that Jesus has a hold of my heart enough that I can record the game. No, I mean, just have my priorities in order. There are those things that we need to do because we're supposed to be eager to do what is good. And so again, we are reminders. Every time somebody sees you, you should be a reflection and a reminder of Jesus. And that's what Paul is telling Titus. When people see you, they should see him. And in fact, Paul was so bold to be like, you want to see what Jesus looks like? Watch me. Now, I don't know that I can always say that. I hope that we can say that more often than not. Question number two. How has Jesus changed you? I would love for you to just kind of define that. Because it's interesting, we've all got our own story. And I don't know everybody here, I don't know if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or if you have not, but guys, there's never a better time than right now to do it. Let's start there. But to ask that question, how has Jesus changed you? How old were you when you accepted Jesus? I and mean, we had a couple of baptisms at our church today, an 81-year-old and a 13-year-old. Awesome. Awesome to be able to pray with an 81-year-old who had never accepted Jesus and to accept Jesus and be baptized a few weeks later. That's incredible. I don't care how old you are, God is working in your life. 
but you should be different. Scripture tells us we're to be a new creation. If you're no different pre-Jesus than you are with Jesus, I would tell you you don't know Jesus. Just because you prayed a prayer, I'm not sure that's exactly what saves you. You've got to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. It's got to be something that you believe and you live and it changes you from the inside out. Now again, just my, I accepted Jesus when I was eight. I got baptized at church when I was eight years old. Now believe me, I have grown and matured in my faith a lot in those years. And believe me, my wife is hoping that I grow and mature a lot in the coming years, right? And yet, I am different. Now I, I don't really remember this life of sin that I was living, but I know that before I accepted as my Lord and Savior, I was separated from God because of my sin. And I've been washed clean and redeemed by him. How has he changed you? And I want you to maybe be willing to share that with people. Go to Titus chapter 3, verse 3 with me. Paul says this, and this is a really good reminder. Because there are some of us that I feel like we've been a Christian for so long that we forget this truth. At one time, we too were foolish disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. There was a time in your life before Jesus. I don't always fully remember it, but there was a time. And sometimes when we look at other people, we're like, Jesus, I would love to go talk to you Talk about you with anyone, but not that person. There are some of those people like anybody but them. Sometimes that's exactly who Jesus calls us to. Sometimes because we need it. Sometimes because they need it. But I want you to be able to tell someone because realistically, that's your story, that's your testimony. How you're different because of Jesus. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was broken, and now I'm whole. I'm not perfect, but I'm covered. And so that's something that I want each and every one of us to be able to share. How has Jesus changed you? When was the last time you talked about that? Sometimes it's just like, like I, I do church, I love Jesus, I live for Jesus, but, but I'm not willing to share Jesus. And this is not your church, this is his church. And that's really important for us to know. I want him to work and move in my heart, in my life, in my community, in my church. That's what I want from him. What are you thankful for? Are you thankful for anything? Like, who's not thankful for the Lions playoff run last year, right? I mean, come on. Yeah. I mean, maybe you're thankful for your home. You're thankful for your... Listen, there are things that I thank God for every day. I hope there are things that you thank God for every single day. I thank God because of who he is. I thank God because of what he's done. And built in here in Titus chapter 3... There's just some beautiful theology and truth written in there. And so if you've got your Bibles, I want you to go stay in chapter 3. I want you verses 4 through 7 of Titus chapter 3. It says this. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Amen. He saved. Remember, I don't save people. You don't save people. Paul doesn't save people. This church doesn't save people. He saves people. And Lord willing, we get to be a part of that story in some way, shape, or form. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope 
of eternal life. So that by his grace, it'll be just as if I had never sinned. That I am washed clean because of him. Amen. Not because of anything that I've ever done. But because, yeah, absolutely, I like it. But that I would be washed clean by that. And I thank God for that. I thank God that I can't earn it. Any of you have ever tried to earn your salvation? Uh, there have been stages in my life where I felt like if I just did more for God, I would get a little more love. If I just did a little bit more, I'll be honest, as a 20-year-old youth pastor, I wanted to set the world on fire for Jesus. But you know what fell short sometimes when I was doing that? I didn't love my wife the best. I burned myself out because I was running and burning the candle at both ends sometimes. I, I want him to know that I am saved by him, and I just want to be used by him. I don't do those things. I don't save people. I just have the opportunity. I am so thankful that I can't earn it, but it's because of his grace and his mercy and his love. Now, I do want to live for him. Is that a desire of your heart, to live for him, to live for his glory? How many of you guys like getting advice? Anybody in here not very good at receiving advice? Yeah, okay, let's be honest. All of us from time to time, depending on what someone is telling us, we don't receive it very well, right? If my wife is like, Kenny, you stink. I'm like, no, it's not that bad, right? Like you just, you, you, may, it, you don't want to face the truth sometimes. But here is Paul giving Titus, his son, just some loving advice within this letter. And here's a few things that he says. He says, be good, be careful, and be wise. Are you good at any of those things? How many of you would say you're good? Okay. I mean, I'm gooder than that person maybe, right? My wife's an English teacher, sorry. No, like if you, I'm not good, but yet I hope that people recognize Jesus and see him in me. Careful. It's interesting. I always tell my wife that careful is my middle name, right? Because my wife likes to use the phrase that boys are dumb, okay? Hey, hey, I know, we resemble that, right? Okay, because there are just, uh, uh, boys do dumb things for some reason. I don't know why, it's because we're boys, right? But be good, be careful, and be wise. Those are probably things we could all maybe use a little bit of improvement in. But I want you to stay with me in Titus chapter 3 and go to verses 8 through 11. Titus chapter 3, verses 8, 9, 10, and 11. Paul says this. He says, this is a trustworthy saying. And I want to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. Now let's pause there for a moment. You are not saved because you do good. But yet James tells us that faith without works is dead. And we should be devoted to glorifying the Lord and doing what is good. And Paul needs to remind Titus of that. Others should see the good in you. Let's continue on. It says, these things are excellent and profitable for everyone. That's good for everyone when we are good and we are glorifying God. Now remember... God appeared and offered salvation to all people. Guess who's all people? Everyone. So the good that you live and the light that you let shine allows other people to see Jesus. Now guys, there's not much better in this world than being a part of somebody's story who is lost and then is found than being able to weave yourself into the fabric of somebody's life and being a part of them coming to know Jesus and being a new creation. 
Now it picks up here, so that's kind of be good, but, but be careful. But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. Warn a divisive person once, then warn them a second time, and after that have nothing to do with them. You may be sure that such people are warped and sinful. They are self-condemned. Dropping my original mic. But think about that for a moment. Avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels. Do you guys know it's an election year? What? Okay. Uh, let me, again, let me just throw this out there. I want you to be more committed to Jesus than any political party. And I don't know how many arguments you can get on social media, but you're probably not going to change somebody's mind by making this post. I want you to love Jesus. We don't preach politics. I want you to prayerfully consider and I want you to vote. You're not my friend based upon who you vote for. I love you because Jesus loved you. And he told me to love my neighbor as myself. And he told me to love the Lord my God with all my heart, my soul, and my mind. Don't get caught up in the drama. How many of you guys like drama? All you women are waving your heads, but you're liars. No, okay, all right. All right, okay. But, but yet, we, I know, I know. Sometimes we gotta take shots. If we can call the boys dumb, we can call the women drama from time to time, right? And I know those are sweeping generalities, but, but we, I get caught up in drama. There is drama that we get caught up within the church in. And yet he's saying, focus, be careful to avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments. Be careful about people that are coming in and trying to sow division. Be careful about people that are coming in and preaching false gospels. Remember, there was this whole group of people that were saying, but you have to be a Jew to be saved. He's going, you need Jesus and Jesus alone. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That is what we want to preach. That is what we want to share. That is what we want to live. And Paul is just reminding Titus, be good, be careful, be wise. Now again, it says, you warn a divisive person once, warn them a second time, then have nothing to do with them. Have you ever had to cut somebody out of your life? That's not an easy thing to do. And there's a variety of things and reasons and ways that we weave that in. But what Paul is saying is, make sure that you're glorifying Jesus with every relationship and everything that you have. And if there are people that are in there that are pulling you away from Jesus, it's a-okay for you to kind of cut that cord and walk away. We don't do that very good as a church. I don't do that very good as a leader and individual all the time. That's really hard to do. And yet Paul is just dropping wisdom on his son who is leading people to Jesus. Be careful, be good, be wise. Now here's another one. Now you want to talk about one of the beauties of at our church having an 81-year-old and a 13-year-old be baptized on the same day. I love that churches are multi-generational. I love that that's your church. That we got amens coming over here from the little one. Listen, you guys could learn something from the little one, right? We want to be excited. We want to be engaged. But yet we're multiple generations. We're different. Every single one of us is a different person. Some of us really like board games. Some of us really like sports. Some of us really like country music. Boo. No, okay, sorry, anyway, anyway. There are just things that we like, but yet, within here, he encourages Titus to remind everyone that they need to keep learning. You guys know, how many of you were good students in school? I'll be honest, I was a good student. How many of you guys were bad students in school? Okay, and that's okay. That's okay. Here's the beauty. We're not in school anymore. Okay? Well, some of you are. But yet we are still learning. Remember, I, if I was eight when I got baptized and I'm 43 now, that's, if my, that's 35 years, right? I have learned a lot in 35 years. But I still have a lot to learn in however long I have left on this earth. 
You have a lot to learn about Jesus. You have a lot to learn in your marriage, in your relationships. You have a lot to learn when you're leading. You have a lot to learn as a parent, as a grandparent, whatever hat or role, as a friend. There is a lot that you have left to learn. In Titus chapter 3, verse 14, this is the second to last verse of this entire letter. Paul says this. Our people, now notice he says this to Titus, our people. Who is your people? This is the body of Christ. This is the church, the church universal. Not Bethel Baptist, not First Baptist of Wyandotte, not everybody that goes to camp. This is the body of Christ universal. Our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order to provide for urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. I mean, again, not everybody that Titus was reaching out to and ministering to was a teenager or a kid. There were people of every different generation in that church, just like in this church. And yet, you have to learn to devote yourselves to doing what is good. You have to learn to provide for urgent needs. How many of you have ever had an urgent need? I mean, we probably all have. And there were probably some people that were there for you in that time of need. And that probably helped strengthen a relationship or maybe blossom a relationship that didn't exist. And then he says, and not to live unproductive lives. How many of you guys want someone to tell you that you have an unproductive life? Those are not fun words to hear. But he's saying we have to learn to do what is good. We have to learn to care for other people. We have to continue to figure out all these behaviors together as the body of Christ. And we do that together. Each and every one of us. We keep learning. Flip with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Remember Paul, what? You don't want me to step on it? Den okay, I know. I've been avoiding it, and you've been staring at it for a while. I just thought Dennis liked my feet. I didn't know what was happening. Okay, all right. Okay, is that better? There we go. Ephesians chapter 5, and remember, the apostle Paul wrote the letter to the church at Ephesus as well. And so he writes this, and so you want to keep learning some things that we should go to as a body of Christ. Verses 1 and 2 of Ephesians chapter 5. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. Now let's just pause there for a moment. How many of you have ever had a mentor or someone you looked up to? Maybe it, was a, maybe it was your parent or a grandparent. Maybe it was a Sunday school teacher. Maybe it was a teacher. Maybe a coach. Maybe it's a celebrity or an athlete. I don't know. There are people that we look up to. I want you to follow God's example, not mine. I hope that my example looks like God's. But I want you, again, to be more committed to following the example of God than anyone else. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. We're to walk in the way of love. Guys, I'm still learning. I don't do that well all the time. If I asked you to name somebody that drive you nuts, what name popped into your mind? Don't look at your wife, Ian. Okay, all right, but no, like, if, if we did that, if I had, there's a name that probably pops in your mind. Maybe your prayer is, God, break my heart for that person. To love them the way that you love me. Guys, we gotta keep learning. We gotta learn how to lead. I mean, Titus had, had traveled with Paul and had served with Paul. In fact, Paul left him on Crete to give him a task to do. And this is Paul's encouragement. And one of those things is we need to keep learning. Our people needs to keep learning. We're to be disciples who are making disciples. Who are you discipling? Who's discipling you? And I hope that those things are happening. And guys, don't get me wrong, your church is awesome, but just coming and listening to a half-hour sermon is not discipleship. 
You need to walk together. You need to live together. You need to spend time in the Word together. You need to break bread together. You need to live life together. Discipleship happens at your table. Discipleship happens in your home. Discipleship should happen when you're together with friends and you just can't help but talk about Jesus and who he is and what he's done. And so that's the challenge for us, just as it was for Titus. Are you a reminder? Are you a reflection of Jesus? Does that little light of yours shine? Has Jesus truly changed you? And if so, are you willing to share that with other people and thank God for what he's done? Are you willing to strive at being good, being careful, and being wise? Not because that's what saves you. Jesus saves you. But because of him saving me, I am a new creation and I'm living for him. And I'm not done learning. Neither are you. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you for the love that Paul had for Titus. I thank you for the love that you have for us. I thank you that we are saved by grace and mercy. God, I pray that we would be a reminder to people in our lives of who you are and what you've done. God, that we would be willing to share the ways that we are changed and transformed and how we've been redeemed. God, help us to be good, to be wise, to be careful. Break our heart for what breaks yours. God, I pray that we would have a spirit of learning, that we would be willing to serve those who are hurting and in need. When Jesus summed up the law and the commandments, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Help us to do that. I pray that we would be more committed to you than anything else in this earth. God, thank you for using broken people like us for your glory. We pray all these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Please stand.
Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your love and your word. God, I pray that we would remind people of you and the hope and the joy we have in you. Father, I pray that we would yearn to live for you and let our light shine for you. Thank you for allowing us to keep learning and to be used for your glory. As we leave this place, may other people see Jesus in us so that they can come to know you as Lord and Savior. We give you all the praise and all the glory, and we pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Have a blessed week. Thank you for allowing me to come and share with you. And uh, let your light shine. And have fun at camp.